Hi everyone, it's James here. Welcome to another video. So I've been away for a few weeks, been uh, a lot going on, so we're uh, hopefully going to be uh, making some more videos now over the coming weeks, months, years, decades. Um, so I'd like to do a response to a lovely little video thread idea put out by Tommy Burton. Now Tommy's been one of my oldest friends here on the Vinyl Community on YouTube for many years, always enjoyed his videos, do check him out if you haven't done already. Very nice guy, very creative, and um, I really liked the theme that he had put out for this. So he wants us to show five albums, weak albums, from the discographies of major artists. So I thought this was an interesting one. A few years ago now I did a video called Mid-Table Albums, and in that video I focused on records which were neither revered as classics nor slagged off as turkeys they were kind of you know in the middle so um and in that video i mainly kind of championed those records as being ones that were uh, you know worth checking out so with this thread i thought okay let's try let's do let's try and go to the bottom of the heap for these artists and try and try and pick out records which are definitely viewed as being if not the weakest but among you know the weaker records and see if i can make a case for any of them so I've got five to show, and um, I've listened to all five of them in the last two or three days, and I like all of them. Um, I'm not going to start getting into whether they are definitely the worst record uh, in the artist's um, catalogue, but what I am going to do, I'm going to give you a couple of little stats. I'm going to give you the chart placing of the record, both in the UK and in the US, and I'm also going to give you what the average... Um, five star rating is on Amazon so what percentage um, of the reviews on Amazon um, for each of these records were five stars because what I do find interesting about this discussion is that these records often they gain a reputation for being um, lousy and it's often because of how they were received when they first came out and um, you know, the way an album is critically viewed when it first comes out and the way it sells sometimes can be an issue uh, in terms of its long-term reputation. Having said that, I do think some records do recover from that. A great example would be Ram by Paul McCartney, which is difficult to believe now, but when Ram came out, it was viewed as being um, a weak album. Critically, it was, not, it was not liked or respected at all. It took many years for that record to start gaining traction, and now it's, you know often viewed as one of McCartney's best records. Not saying that that's true for all of these, but certainly you'll be surprised, I think, when you uh, hear what the Amazon ratings are for these. Okay, so after that rather long preamble, let's begin. <laughs> so the first one is a record that I've always really, really enjoyed, and I've only just got a copy of it on vinyl in the last maybe three or four weeks. Picked this up from eBay a while ago. This is John Lennon and Yoko Ono, and sometime in New York City, and this record came out in 1972. It was recorded shortly after um, John and Yoko moved to New York. They got involved with um, some, you know, radical politics. They got involved in the. Um, there was some. There was a movement to um, support John Sinclair, who was a, a radical left-wing writer, I think, and. Um, you know, John had always had a bit of a political streak and he decided he was going to jump on board this. And so John and Yoko put together a an album. Now I'm not I'm not focusing on the second album because this is a double album. There's a studio side, there's a live side. I'm not going to focus on the live side. The live side is pretty ropey really. The studio side, however, I mean, for years I, I read about this album and how it was meant to be dreadful and I just couldn't believe how good it was when I played it. It's a rocking, funky, loose kind of record. Yeah, it's not the best songs that John ever wrote. Having said that, I really, really like um, Yoko's songs on this record. Sisters Oh Sisters, so infectious. And We're All Water in the end is fantastic. She's got an absolutely brilliant fade out with all this kind of, you know, Yoko screaming. Angela is a good track, um, and John's got some good stuff on here as well. The actual track New York City, which is quite sort of dirty and funky. You know, the look of the Irish. I mean, McCartney did a, an Irish song of a similar theme about this time as well. So, you know, I mean, you can knock John for the politics, I guess, if you want to. I mean, I don't particularly have a problem with it. Um, in my experience, most people who seem to knock politics in music tend to be kind of right-wing people who are knocking left-wing politics. As I'm quite a left-wing person, so uh, 
I often don't find it objectionable when these artists like whatever, like John Lennon or Neil Young, you know, express their opinions. I don't seem to get quite so hot under the collar as a lot of people seem to for some reason. Um, but um, unfairly maligned album, definitely, I'd say. So um, here we go. So the charts uh, got to number 11 in the UK, 48 in the US. And um, just a couple of re reviews of this record. So the NME, in, a, in an open letter to John Lennon, said, Lennon, you're a pathetic ageing revolutionary. And um, so there we go. That's kind of gives you a flavour of some of the more contemporary um, reviews that were around at the time. In more recent times, Uncut magazine uh, said uh, that the album was a contender for the worst LP by a major political figure. I think that's meant to be major musical figure. Well, it could be a political figure. I'm not too sure. Uh, oh, and um, I missed this one back in the day. Rolling Stone called it shallow and derivative. So that kind of gives you some sense of how it was received at the time. Amazon, um, five star reviews. 57% of the reviews in Amazon were five stars. So well over half of people who bought that record and reviewed it on Amazon think it's a five star record. So there we go. Interesting. <laughs> Right, okay, next one, next one. <clears throat> We've got this, Led Zeppelin, In Through the Outdoor, which was the last album they recorded uh, as a band prior to John Bonham's death. Obviously, Coda came out after that. This one came out in, I think it was 1979. Got to number one in the UK and got to number one in the US as well. And um, this record, I think... It's generally viewed as the weakest of the Led Zeppelin albums, you know, apart from Coda. Interesting genesis to the record. I mean, my understanding is that it was it was a bit of a John Paul Jones effort, really. John Paul Jones and Robert Plant got together and started doing some writing. At the time, Jimmy Page, I think, was starting to sink into heroin addiction. He wasn't quite so... Um, creative at this point. I know John Bonham was in a bit of a state, although he plays some fantastic stuff on this record. So I guess the thing that puts people off this album, it's quite kind of keyboard heavy and synth heavy. It's an interesting album. It dabbles with um, kind of world music, really. There are some songs that sort of play around with, um, you know, Latin music. There's some kind of New Orleans stuff on here. Yeah, so you've got the song Caracelambra which has definitely got a bit of a Latin feel to it. And um, South Beyond Sodes, which is a Jones and Plant song, that's got a bit of a kind of jambalaya kind of flavour to it. Um, it is a bit of a, a mixture, this record. There's some really good stuff on it, and there's some stuff where you think, yeah, I think Page in particular is not at his best. He does some really cack-handed playing on, um, on the track Hot Dog, where he tries to do some Eddie Cochran kind of runs, and they really don't work at all. But then on the last track, I'm Gonna Crawl, uh, he really does play some blazing blues licks, you know. Um, Plant's voice is maybe not at its best, but um, I do think this album is definitely not as bad as people make out. It's an interesting record, interesting material. Show Zeppelin, I think, angling themselves maybe towards a more kind of art rock sound, which they started doing on Houses of the Holy anyway, I think. But it's certainly interesting to um, you know speculate where they would have gone after this. John Bonham is fantastic on it, and really, really great drumming on that record. So at the time it came out, the melody maker said <laughs> this record had everyone in the office rolling around laughing. I think you know it came out in 1979, where all the new wave stuff was going on. Zeppelin was seen almost as public enemy number one, really, apart from Pink Floyd. You know, they were not being given um, much love at all, really. And the Village Voice, uh, in contrast, said it was the best Zeppelin album since Houses of the Holy. So there you go. There was not unanimous condemnation for it. So like I said, chart-wise, number one uh, in the UK and in the US. And on Amazon, five-star reviews, 83% of people rated Into the Outdoor as five stars. So, um, yeah, not as unpopular as you might think. Right, next one, we have Van Morrison. And this is his album, um, A Period of Transition, which I believe came out, yeah, came out in 1977. And this album, I wouldn't say this album is known as being like, you know, the very worst of Van Morrison's catalogue, but I think it's seen as being a disappointment in context. You know, a lot of these records, they're seen as being a disappointment because of the records that preceded them. 
it's that classic thing where an artist releases you know x number of really great albums and then they bring one out which is not as good and therefore it gets kind of slagged off or tainted a classic example would be um hotter than july by stevie wonder which is a fine record but unfortunately it came on the back of all those fantastic albums that he did so therefore it's kind of you know thrown into shade this one obviously comes in the wake of you know god knows how many classic records got moon dance Ferd and fleece um you know etc etc it was a team up with mac rebernack um otherwise known as dr john the two of them had played um with the band on the last waltz and that's how they'd come together now i've only really been a Van Morrison fan maybe in the last five years or so but I've been a Dr John fan for many years I got it, um, into him back in the 90s and if I'd have heard this record back in the 90s when I was getting into Dr John I would have just absolutely flipped my lid over it because it's just it's got that kind of Dr John rolling piano groove to it very funky very loose definitely not Van Morrison in his kind of ethereal mode but if you want to pour yourself a glass of wine, you know, dance around the room to it. I can't sit still and listen to this record. It's very upbeat. It's, you know, like I said, very funky. But it does have some great sort of van moments on it as well. You've got the Eternal Kansas City at the end of side one, which starts with this kind of church choir thing, and it's really kind of churchy and spiritual sounding. Side two, you've got Joyous Sound and Flamingos Fly, both of which are beautiful tracks, and then Cold Wind in August. Actually, Heavy Connection as well is a bit of a van classic, I think. So, the, I mean, this album took me totally by surprise. Um, when I was getting into Van a few years ago, I was reading up about his albums and watching certain videos as well on YouTube, rankings videos, and people didn't seem to rate it at all. But, um, I, you know, I think it's a really, really nice record. So chart-wise, it got to number 23 in the UK, 43 in the US. I was reading about it. Apparently, one of the things that, was, uh, that people found disappointing about it at the time was that it came out in 77, when you had artists such as Springsteen breaking through and it was the new wave era so you had Graham Parker, Elvis Costello and I think people had been expecting something more from Van, something with a bit more grit I suppose or a bit more kind of real world stuff where it seemed like a record where he was taking his foot off the gas a little bit, a bit like um, Nashville Skyline, Bob Dylan, people were expecting something and what he produced you know was not what they were expecting. Rolling Stone, Greil Marcus, um, when the record came out, he, he said there's a lot of neo R&B huffing and puffing. So that was his view of it. And Village Voice said, in general, this is an unexciting record. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, unexciting. So, um, on Amazon, this one didn't score as well as the others that I've mentioned. 69% uh, gave it a five-star review, so still... You know, still some support. Actually, yeah, so this has got more support than John Lennon, New York City. So, um, yeah, if you don't know this record, if you've heard that it's perhaps not one of Van's best ones, I'm not going to say if it is or not, but I would say definitely check it out. Particularly if you're a fan of kind of R&B and funk and kind of bluesy stuff, you know. Um, it's good fun. Definitely an enjoyable record. Right, so the next one. We move now to 1978, and we're going to look at Yes and Tormato, featuring the famous Hypnosis cover, which the band were not too pleased about, where there was, um, I think Hypnosis were maybe casting around for inspiration, and they came up with the idea of just holding a tomato at the painting and uh, taking a photo of it. I think it works quite well, I think it's quite funny. Um, <laughs> so this album, this album, right. Rick Waitman was back in the band, they'd done um, Relayer with uh, Patrick Moraz and then they got back together with Rick Waitman to do uh, Going For The One and then I think this album came after that. Now again it came out in 1978, a lot of new wave stuff around at the time. Record Mirror said, described the album with these words, maximum pomposity, maximum pretension, maximum elaboration, all covering up minimal inspiration. So that gives you a flavour. However, the LA Times said that this would eventually emerge as one of Yes's most strongest and most important albums. So there you go. Um, what do I think of this record? Uh, well, <laughs> I think it's it's enjoyable. It's definitely not Yes at their best. Um, Rick Waitman, I think, is particularly irritating on this record. He plays too much. He plays in all the gaps. He's constantly whittling away, playing his arpeggios and what he contributes, I don't think, is necessarily always what the song demands. But um, 
song-wise, it's actually quite a pared-down album. Most of the songs are quite short. Most of them are quite tuneful. There's a lot going on, but it's definitely not kind of indigestible. Um, I think because the songs are quite short. I mean, it features the song um, that was a single, actually. In fact, I think it was a top 40 single, um, which is Don't Kill the Whale, which I think is one of Yes's finest moments, really. It's got some great singing on it, some great arranging. You've also got this, uh, uh, a song which is really kind of hard driving, stripped back kind of sound. Um, and that is, what is it? Release, release. Uh, the last song on side one. It's got some really kind of heavy Steve Howe guitar on it. Um, it's quite pared back. It sounds like it's not like Queen doing Sheer Heart Attack in 1977, but you get the sense that they are dimly aware of what's going on in the world beyond their four walls, you know. A slight nod to, not to the new wave movement exactly, but they're trying to kind of pare things down a bit. If you had not listened to Yes and you said to me, shall I start with Tales and Topographic Oceans or Tomato, I would definitely say start with this record. Um, like I said, I think it's a shame that Waitman kind of overplays on it. If Patrick Moraz had been on this record, I think it would have been a lot better. But it's definitely not as bad as people say. I mean, this, this album has got a fairly bad reputation. People talk about, oh, you know, Tomato, it was... It was it was the sort of end of the 70s and they'd run out of steam and they were really going nowhere. Um, but it's it's not it's not as bad as that, you know. So, and I mean, chart-wise, it did OK. It got to number eight in the UK, number 10 uh, in the US, which is not bad. And on, uh, on Amazon, it has 63% five-star reviews, would you believe? So, yes, fans clearly, you know, don't hate it as much as um, they've been told to. So, uh, yeah. Not fantastic, uh, but not a bad album, I would say. Tomato by Yes. Right, so, uh, okay, so this next one, or this last one, this is the one, I think, maybe, apart from the John Lennon one, out of all these records, this one maybe has got the worst reputation. I could be wrong. This is David Bowie and Tonight, which came out in, I think, 84. Um, so, yeah, I mean... Bowie had had this incredible run in the 70s, going into the 80s, of course, with um, Scary Monsters. Then he'd done Let's Dance with Nile Rodgers, which was his huge breakthrough international album, you know. Uh, it really turned him, to, turned him into a major pop star. He'd been a, a huge rock star, but now he was a big, huge pop star. And um, I think at the time, Nile Rodgers was very disappointed that he wasn't asked back to do the next record. He made a curious production choice. He picked... David Bramble, sorry, Derek Bramble, who was a fairly obscure musician, really. He'd been in Heatwave, hadn't he? Um, but he hadn't really done much. I don't know the story of why he chose him, why he thought he would be the producer. But he brought in Hugh Padgham, but Hugh Padgham was only brought in to engineer the record. Um, but at the time, he'd already become a really big producer. He'd done The Police, and uh, he was already a hotshot producer. But he agreed to just you know, be the engineer for Bowie, because he was in awe of Bowie. Um, but I don't think I don't think Derek Bramble really had the production chops really to handle Bowie, and I think Bowie went into the record maybe with a not huge amount of enthusiasm. It's a bit of a mishmash. There were some songs he covered some songs from a couple of different Iggy Pop albums. There's a couple of songs I think from Lust for Life, isn't there? And uh, and he also wrote a couple with um, with Iggy in the studio. He wrote Blue Jean and Dancing with the Big Boys with Iggy in the studio, and they're kind of okay. They're not bad. Um, and there's a couple of covers, which are not wonderful. God Only Knows, a cover of that, I don't think is as bad as people make out. I don't mind it, really. I mean, it's one of those songs where you think, it's such a great song, it's such a classic, you better have something really good to, you know, to say about it or to do with it. I'm not convinced he does, but it's not a dreadful version. And then there's an old R&B song here as well, I Keep Forgetting, on side two, which again is kind of all right. The two kind of gems on this record for me are Loving the Alien, which is the first song, which I really could have been on Scary Monsters. You know, it's got a kind of art rock thing going on. It's got Carlos Alomar on guitar. Really kind of uh, strange, inventive kind of song. I think it's just really good. And then 
um, the cover version of Don't Look Down, which was from one of the Iggy Pop albums. It wasn't from Lust for Life, it was from a different one. That is fantastic. It's a kind of reggae version, and it's done really well. I mean, it's cod reggae, but it's done well. It's um, It's got beautiful production, really, really great. And... Um, yeah, so those two tracks, good. On side two, Neighbourhood Threat is okay. Um, Tumble and Twirl is an original um, Iggy and Bowie track, which is kind of all right. It's kind of, it's all right. It's a pop album with some hints of art rock. Um, I'd heard lots of things about this record being dreadful. My friend here on DVC, Sean Whelan, he sent me a copy of this or this copy of it last year I think and um, I listened to it and I thought yeah this is actually this is okay I can hear how it would have been disappointing at the time um, you know coming off the back of that fantastic run of albums but um, it's not terrible Bowie himself uh, I think realized it wasn't a great record he was interviewed shortly after its release and he was already kind of apologizing for it it's interesting because the same thing happened with Paul McCartney and um, Press to Play which Tommy showed in his video he was interviewed shortly after the release of that record and he was also kind of already apologising for it, you know, having realised it wasn't maybe that great. But what's funny is that Hugh Padgham was also the producer of that record too. So in the space of maybe two years, three years, Hugh Padgham basically worked, uh, helped to make one of the least regarded David Bowie albums and then went on to record one of the least regarded Paul McCartney albums as well. So he wasn't having a particularly wonderful purple patch there, but... Um, yeah, I don't think it's it's that bad, really. I think it's it's okay and good in places. Now, chart-wise, UK, number one. It was a number one album for Bowie. And got to number 11 in the US. Um, Rolling Stone said, This album is throwaway and David Bowie knows it. But the enemy uh, described it as having a dizzying variety of mood and techniques. So it wasn't even universally slagged off at the time of its release. Amazon, 77% um, of people um, gave it five stars. So there you go, tonight, you know, 77% of people think it's a five-star record. So it is a curious topic, isn't it? These records, which they're kind of, they are viewed as being weak, but then when you actually get into some of the chart placings and how they're regarded today, maybe the story is not quite as straightforward and maybe some of them have been reappraised and maybe some of them were more successful at the time than we than we thought anyway so what Tommy said in his video was that he wanted us to show albums that were perceived as being the weakest and he he specifically said we're not talking about like definite dreadful <laughs> dreadful albums so I tried to steer away from dreadful albums I don't know if I've got any truly dreadful albums in my collection I've probably got a few but that might be the next thread to come up I don't know it's a bit depressing talking about truly dreadful albums isn't it I was, it's quite enjoyable talking about these kind of underdog albums, which are seen as being weak. I've always, I've always gravitated toward those records. You know, I mean, we've all heard the classics, haven't we, over and over again? So it's kind of, it's good fun to pay homage to some of these lesser known ones. Right, goodness me, that was longer than I intended, but um, hope you enjoyed it. And uh, do please jump on Tommy's thread if you have any inclination. And uh, thanks for watching, everybody. Um, I picked up some new subscribers. This is on the back of the mammoth discussion video that I did with Andrew Dixon a few weeks back. Um, Andrew and I did a big thing on, on um, Wings and McCartney and um, I was totally overwhelmed by the response to that video. It was fantastic. It was a, it was a kind of real labour of love style video and it did very well and I think I've picked up some more subs off the back of it. So if you're new to the channel, thanks very much for joining me and if you're one of the old ones, lovely to have you uh, back and um, I shall be back soon hopefully for more for more videos so take care and uh, i'll see you all soon bye bye